We're getting loads of questions coming in, so thanks very much and keep them coming. And don't forget, if you're just watching and you've got an opinion, you've got a view, you wanna add something, I'm sure that all our people that send questions in would love to hear your views as well. Okay, so here's one from Kieran. Now, uh, Kieran, we've had a bit of um, emails going backwards and forwards with Kieran, and he sent us a great bit of video here. Hi, Skill Builder. So this is our extension. Uh, and what we wanted to do initially was, you can see uh, down here, there's a slight step up between the kitchen and the dining room. Um, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to uh, lower the floor. Uh, as we started looking at this, we noticed that there's a few problems and that it's a suspended floor. So there's a bit of bounce and give in the floor, but also uh, down here in this corner, you can see that there's, you know, a definite gap and sag in the floor. Um, not quite sure what's going on with this corner, um, but that's one of the things we wanted to do. We figured we would just uh, replace the floor with like a concrete floor, um, because then you don't have to worry about kind of joists and stuff sagging. Um, as we were looking and we were kind of addressing this, uh, we have this cupboard here, and sorry, this is gonna take a moment. But what we discovered is as we took up the floor, you can see that this, I'll pause here because it's just a friggin' mess of God knows what. Um, but as we're looking here, we discovered, ugh, so you can see there's kind of pipes and God knows what, and down here, there's a drain which flows out and this is all kind of loose under the floor. I don't really know what's down there. There's electrical cables. So if there's anything you can do to suggest how we fix this, it will be greatly appreciated. <laughs> Blimey's right, isn't it? It is a mess. And do you know what? The, the rescuer in me, I'd love to get out there and sort that lot out. Do it really, I can't. I mean, I must resist doing this because my wife has said I've got to spend a year at home doing our house up. It's that old story of tradesmen's house is the last one to be done up. So I'm sorry about that, Kieran. I'd love to get there. I'm afraid, my friend, that what, what he's got there is just horrible, isn't it? Why has it got that jump up from one floor to another? Somebody's just chucked that over the top there. And they've also got an old gully. So when this was done as an extension, that gully existed and they haven't bothered doing anything with it because they thought, oh, that'd be handy. We can run the boiler condensate into that drain. So that's what that pipe is that's running down now. That's a complete mess. And that pipe is just run into that gully under the floor to take the condensate from the boiler. He's right. I mean, I don't know what's happening down there. Where that drain goes to, it goes to a manhole. Is the manhole covered up or not? We don't know. If he's getting smells, it would suggest it's not. But I think it's going to be one of those ones where he's going to open the floor up or someone's going to open that floor up and they're just going to find all manner of things there. So what it's going to need is completely ripping out, unfortunately. Just take the whole thing out, all the timber, everything else, and get some damp proof membrane down on that floor then get some PIR board or whatever some Celotex Kingspan that kind of thing on that floor as a layer of insulation then I would be tempted to put the underfloor heating down because even if you only put the pipes in now run the manifolds later on when you can afford it at least you've got that pipe in that floor ready to heat that floor up and it'd be fantastic to get the underfloor heating in at the same time as you did that. You've got to make up some, some ground anyway because under that floor there's a void and that void can be filled with insulation, then the underfloor heating, then a bit of screed over the top of that and then you've got yourself a, a good job. But all that pipe work, unfortunately, all that drainage, all that mess of pipe work in that cupboard is going to have to come out and be redone because it's just awful. Now, I'm just going to ask one question, Kieran, here, and that is... Was that house surveyed? When you bought it, did you get a survey on that house? Because if you did, and the surveyor missed that lot, then I think you've got a very, very good case against the surveyor. Because anybody that was buying that house 
if they didn't know about all those problems and all that expense. And let's face it, that, that's a job. He said he's had a couple of builders in to look at it already and they've just gone off, they don't want to know. It's not the kind of job everybody wants to take on. It's, you know, it needs a skip, it needs some ripping out. And if you're handy, Kieran, you could do a lot of that yourself, rip up all that lot, clear out all the timber, get rid of everything you can, clean it out completely, and then you are leaving a blank canvas for a builder to come in there and do that job. And in that circumstance, I think it would be a, a nice one to do really. For a lot of builders, they would then look at it and go, oh, okay, I can take that job on now. But there is a bit of drainage there. There's some, probably some drains to be moved around and um, just nasty stuff. I feel sorry for you, mate, I really do. But don't be downhearted because there will be an answer to it and you will get there but it's just, uh, you've got to go through a bit of pain first. I think if I was doing this, I'd, I'd probably get in there, rip the thing out, probably take a day to rip it out, quite honestly. It would take another two, three days to sort the plumbing out, day or two to sort the drains out, a couple of days to lay the insulation, the underfloor heating, get the screed laid down. A little team of builders, say three of them, maximum of two weeks work there. So. If you're looking at 35 man days, if you were pricing a job like that, you might end up paying 10,000 quid for it. So sorry if that depresses you, mate. Anyway, any builders interested in it, have a look. Get in touch with us and we'll put you in touch with Kieran. Ah, oh, I just noticed you've got a cheeky second question here. Yeah, here we go then. Let's have a look at this. Hopefully you can just about see it on the wall. There's these weird, like, I don't know snail trails i'm not sure what you call them there's kind of there's a couple along the wall you can see there's a line there in the middle uh i'm not sure if it's is it damp you know you can see there's a massive uh sort of section that goes all the way around here um and then here as well they're a bit more obvious at this point any ideas <laughs> it does seem like you've got slugs crawling up the wall or something like that funny thing about that is you see the trails in the morning but you never see them because they only come out when you've gone to bed i think it's all related to this damp problem whether that's something that's creeping up behind the plaster or something that's crawling over the walls because you've got smells under there because you've got damp under there because you've got open drains under there i think that once you cure all those problems and get that kitchen dried out those other problems will disappear but at the moment it's hard to tell what that is but certainly as soon as you lift those floorboards you'll see if there's a colony of slugs snails frogs you name it living under those boards uh, you'll find out about it but um yeah that, i wouldn't worry about that in initial stage get the other work done first and then see what you're left with now we've got a question from ali and this is complicated because it's not one question it's several questions so let's just have a look at this let's see what ali's got to say right he's doing up a house he's got a load of work to do he wants to add a couple of bathrooms and he's saying he needs to put down a subfloor before he sticks down tiling or whatever else doesn't like hung and groove chipboard because he thinks it squeaks we know about that we've fixed some tongue and groove chipboard one of the reasons tongue and groove chipboard squeaks by the way is because people don't put the glue in in between the joints and then those joints are dry in there and they just move very slightly even if you screw it down after a while they start just moving and it says on the instructions these joints must be glued so you put some pva in there give yourself a good run of pva both sides of the tongue by the way not just on the top and then if you do that and you put them together and then you screw the board down properly, you'll find it doesn't squeak. It's absolutely fine. Having said that, I don't like it either as something to tile onto. And he's saying, should he use plywood? Well, plywood's one option. There are lots of other options around, but you can use some plywood and then use something like an uncoupling membrane on top of the plywood before you put the tiles down and uh, that's a great way to go because then you don't get the cracking with the tiles. So that's one question. What else have we got? We've got soundproofing. He wants to do some resilient bars above the floor. Are there any better options? Well, funnily enough, there's a company called Thermal Economics that I've had quite a lot to do with in the past and they do do a system which might overcome two problems in one. In other words, it's a flooring material which has got a resilient layer of rubber underneath it and that stops the sound transmission through from one floor to another so i'm guessing he wants to use this as a multi-occupancy 
dwelling. Uh, he wants to, maybe he's got somebody in the flat upstairs and he wants to soundproofing on the floor downstairs. So there's loads and loads of information on that and, and ways in which you should go about that. But the important thing is with sound reduction, we won't call it soundproofing, is that you've got to do the job properly, you've got to do the spec, and you can't even afford to leave a tiny gap anywhere, air gap around the edge. So it's all got to be sealed up, foamed up, because if you leave a tiny gap, the sound gets through. It's very, very clever at getting through any little hole it can find. So yeah, have a look at that. Party wall, same thing goes. Use the system. You just need to stand the resilient bars free of the structure, and you need loads of rock wall in there. One of the general principles of sound deadening is the more dense the material, the more sound deadening you get from it. So it's worth remembering that, that if you can put something heavy in there, they used to put lead sheet in there back in the day. Uh, the other thing he's got is he said he's got a gas boiler, showed us the gas boiler, that's right, it's a combi. And he wants a summer operation on his tail, towel, towel, towel rail. He wants a summer operation on his towel rail. And he said, not a fan of the dual fuel option. So what can he do? Um, right, you're not a fan of the dual fuel. The dual fuel is a little immersion heater that you put inside the tower rail. You can go and buy those from the plumbers, merchants, screw fix, tool station, places like that. That screws into the tower rail and it means you've got an electric option as well as the hot water. You can run it in the summer just from the electric on a timer, or you can run it in the winter off the central heating. And the reason they're good is because if you're running a combi boiler, you don't have that option where you have a hot water cylinder, which is feeding the tower rail with, you know, hot water when, it, when it's heating up the cylinder. So doing it on a combi boiler is possible, but it's complicated. It will be an absolute pain to do. You know, you're talking motorized valves, you're talking about a separate circuit to the, the tower rail. And uh, what I would do, and then of course your boiler is going to run just specifically to do one tower rail, which it means it's going to be cycling on and off because it's not quite enough flow rate for it to do a good job. So quite honestly, mate, what I'd say to you is go for the fuel, dual fuel option, put that little immersion heater in there, 15, 20 quid, problem solved, you've got it. It's not going to cost you a fortune to run it, it's only a little heater. Once it heats up, it clicks off, it's got a thermostat on it and if you put it on a timer. I've got a couple in my house and they work perfectly well during the summer and um, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. So that's it, so that's it from Ali, thanks very much indeed. Leo Carswell and Leo, oh goodness me, look at this, he's showing us some dodgy DIY plumbing that he's got in his house and uh, it's a 1950s semi, the old council house, I'm pretty sure, I know the ones, and he's gonna take all that out and he's going to redo it all but in the initial stages he's got a new combi boiler which looks pretty good but he said the flow rate on the shower upstairs is a bit pathetic and he's thinking the boiler's man enough to do it and the boiler is definitely man enough to do it it's a nice boiler so uh, he shouldn't be experiencing any lack of lack of hot water through that shower so he's looking at this device down here under this rat's nest of pipes and, and he's saying that that thing that we can see there he said it looks like a pressure reducing valve uh, do I think that could be causing some of the lack of flow and I would say definitely it actually looks to me like a pressure reducing valve that somebody's nicked out of an old combi boiler so when they scrapped a combi boiler they thought oh, I'm going to take that pressure reducing valve out and I'm going to put it into my plumbing system which is all very well if it does the job you want it to do but why does he need it? He doesn't need it. Maybe on the old boiler, he did need it. But on this boiler, I'm pretty sure he doesn't need it at all. So what I would do is I would turn the water off, take that pressure reducing valve out, bridge that with a bit of copper pipe and see what difference it makes. And I would do that before I did any of the other plumbing because he's dead right. It does need doing it. Badly needs tidying up uh, and rationalizing. But it would be nice to know how that flow rate was before you start doing all that work. And the other thing is, look at this, isn't it horrendous that over the front of that boiler, he's got a, a mag filter, it's a Furnox one actually, but what they do is they reduce the sludge, they take all the, all the magnetite out of the water so that they keep the water clean as it's going into the boiler. A lot of boiler manufacturers now insist on having those, by the way, they're a great thing, but 
you do see people putting them in the most horrendous places and whoever put that one in front of the boiler like that okay you could box it in but surely you could just put it under the boiler surely there's room under there to to stick that out the way but anyway that's uh that's the little question there definitely take that pressure reducing valve out thanks leo Hello, here's a question from James Air now. Hi James, uh, and you have an old 1920s house, solid walls, and it's freezing cold, so you've been insulating the walls, a great job. And he's been using PIR board, battens and plasterboard over there to just to beef up the insulation in that room. I bet it's making a hell of a difference as well. I bet that's really good. And what he's asking is, uh, can I foresee any problems with this? Well, the only thing I'd say is when you're thinking of any insulation, the most important principle when you think about insulation is the dew point. This is where the airborne moisture in the house will travel through whatever you've put up and it will end up condensing on the cold side of the insulation. So if you think about it, the cold side of your insulation is going to be onto the old brick wall. So you will get moisture and mildew building up on that wall behind the insulation if you don't make sure that you stop that migration. Now the way to stop that migration is what they call a vapor barrier. So you have the vapor barrier behind the plasterboard. Now if you've already done those walls, you've plasterboarded up and you haven't put the vapor barrier on there, then it's a little bit too late to do that. So what I would do there is I would use a few coats of vinyl paint over the top of the plasterboard where you've had it plastered or even just uh, dry lined, but use some vinyl paint just to stop the moisture from migrating through. Believe it or not, it can still migrate through vinyl paint but at least you'll be helping the situation but for this remaining wall or for any future walls you're doing if when you've got those battens there you either get some polythene it doesn't, doesn't have to be thick polythene it can be more like the decorators cover sheet polythene but whatever you do put up polythene over the whole wall tightly to the edges of the wall even tape the joints so that no moisture can migrate through the plasterboard and then through that wall and get behind that that insulation and condense on the cold wall. I know it sounds a little bit like a sort of panic measure because you think, hang on, I've got foil-faced insulation. The only place that that moisture can get behind is behind the battens uh, by migrating through the battens and condensing on there. But that's the very place you don't want it. In the end, you would see some stripes appearing on the wall where that cold bridging was happening. So the other alternative to using polythene is foil-backed plasterboard which is an absolutely brilliant product it's got that super reflective uh, back as well so it warms the room up and the best best ever solution you can get is to have a very very slight gap between the foil back plasterboard and the PIR, PIR insulation and if you had that if you had something like even 10 mil of air gap there you get this fantastic reflection a rate of radiated heat so that it doesn't actually cross that barrier and that becomes very very effective indeed as an insulation barrier so if you can do that if you can achieve that you've got absolute perfection don't forget to subscribe because we love to see those subscriber numbers coming up you can do us a favor if you've had your question answered you if you found this information useful reward us by subscribing to our channel that way you don't owe us anything is that all right? That's fine. Okay, we're done. That's good.